Thank you. Thank you, John, for having me here. Um, I, I was actually going to introduce my parents because I grew up in New Hampshire. And the last time that I was on a stage in New England, I was dancing the role of Princess Aurora in my senior recital of Sleeping Beauty. And so I'm very happy that my mom and dad get to be in the audience today. And they will, yes, another round of applause for my parents. They will definitely remember the first story that I'm going to share. Most of the time when I was in high school, it was a good thing to be featured in the school newspaper. But I was sitting in class one afternoon during my senior year when I came to realize that there are times when it clearly is not. I belong to a club called Peer Advisory. As members, we served as advisors and organized activities for middle school students. It was a good group overall, but some of the members who also happened to be some of the most popular kids in school had started drinking and partying on weekends. They were not, in my eyes, living up to the club's mission of being role models. So after learning this, I decided that the most appropriate next step for me to take was to bring this up for discussion at one of our club meetings, where I also proposed that every member sign a pledge agreeing not to drink. As you might imagine, berating your fellow teenagers for their behavior and for the fact that they weren't being very good role models didn't go over so well. And they weren't big fans of the pledge idea either. So then I'm sitting in class a few days later when the school newspaper is delivered. And I open it up and see my name in the news brief section. But it's not celebrating something wonderful I had done. It was one line. And all it said was, Hey, Jess Lawrence, you suck. <laughs> it turned out that a few of the members of Peer Advisory were also editors of the newspaper. <laughs> and they had slipped that one line in after the principal had already signed off on the final draft. As a final act in utter high school mortification that day, the principal then made the editor-in-chief apologized to me publicly <laughs> over the school's address system. <laughs> but beyond this momentary embarrassment, it turned out that I didn't really care what the popular kids thought. I didn't really care what they said about me in the paper. And I wasn't too worried about breaking social rules. What I cared about was doing what I thought was right. It's not already clear. I'm someone who likes rules. I'm careful. I tend to like order. I'm the person who showed up at college and wandered the halls of my dorm picking up abandoned beer cans, wondering where all of the adults were. <laughs> I'm a person who doesn't cut in line, who stays to the right on the sidewalk, and who always carries Band-Aids. <laughs> but even for me, not all rules are created equal. Teenage social rules could be trumped by this higher order rule of doing the right thing. And for those of us who are overcome with these visions of what's wrong and how it could be made right, we often find ourselves in positions of leadership because at least at first, we can't stand that gap between what is and what could be a space that educator Parker Palmer calls the tragic gap. Our early efforts at leadership are all about action. We plow ahead trying to escape that uncomfortable gap as fast as possible, trying to get to that place where things have been made right. But my bull in a china shop method of trying to close that gap in high school had backfired. I still had a lot to learn about leadership and change. And starting my career, in a 100-year-old organization would turn out to be the perfect classroom. I started out as a fundraising associate at a Girl Scout council in Southern California. And I quickly learned that although Girl Scouts has an amazing mission and does great work for girls, the organization itself was struggling with bureaucracy and hierarchy and a lot of rules that did more harm than good. Over the years, it had developed an unhealthy culture, a culture that really diminished human potential instead of elevating it. And I worked in this environment for five years, at first sort of accepting that this was how work was. But slowly, it started feeling worse and worse. 
And I started thinking that this is not how work was supposed to be. Luckily, I was eventually appointed, appointed CEO when I was 28 years old, and then I got to be in charge. And I realized that I should start making some changes. So my first attempt at change was to implement a flexible work program. I decided that employees of a certain level and above could apply to work from home one day a week. But right before I was about to launch this program, one of my employees pulled me aside. She was one of the lowest paid people in the organization. And she said, Jessica, why is it that the highest paid people get to save money on gas and commuting costs one day a week when people like me who need that savings the most don't get to participate? Do you trust us less? I was speechless. I had never thought about trust in that context. This idea that your trustworthiness increases with your pay grade had been standard practice. And there I was about to follow in that tradition. I had tried gently pushing back against the rules, but it wasn't enough. We realized we needed to throw out the whole rule book and start with something new. So we made bold, rapid changes. We became the first nonprofit in the country to implement a results-only work environment where employees could work wherever they wanted, whenever they wanted, as long as their work got done. We recentered our organization around trust, and we worked hard to change the culture. And things got better. Employees were more engaged. They were happier to come to work. They were more creative and took more risks. Their well-being improved, and our business performance improved as well. It wasn't perfect, but we were on this up, up, up trajectory until it stalled. Some of the people who had been applauding the idea of change were not as enthusiastic when it came time to actually start changing. We were moving too fast, and the amount of change we were asking them to make became too scary. I learned that although I had started out with all of the right intentions of implementing this change for the benefit of others, I had become a bit too focused on my own desire to escape that uncomfortable gap and get to that place where things had been made right. And I had let that space that I usually left open for others close just a little bit. A few years ago, I left Girl Scouts, moved to New York, and started my current work at New York Tech Meetup. And I expected that the technology sector would be filled with incredibly enlightened people who, <laughs> who were not only building innovative products, but also building truly innovative workplaces. I thought they would be the ones driving all of the types of change I had tried to implement at Girl Scouts. I thought they would be writing better rules of business and adopting more humane practices of work. And while some are, a significant portion of this whole new generation of leaders are not advocating for the type of change I expected and the type of change I think we need. They still seem to be embracing this relentless, win-at-all-costs attitude, a mentality that emphasizes constant action. But as I had learned, being able to pause is essential for creating the space needed in leadership. Space to truly see and hear others. Space for difference. Space for agency and potential to flourish. Space to learn as I did from the people working alongside you, asking you tough questions. If I could go back and revisit my 17-year-old self, I would stand next to her and give her hand a squeeze. I would tell her to slow down a little. I would tell her to listen, not just to the supposed experts, but to all of those around her and to herself. I would tell her to have courage and patience to stay in that gap. And I would tell her not to lose her boldness. Because having something that you are willing to take action on is essential even if you eventually realize that sometimes the best thing to do is pause and listen. Thank you.